after a pleasant journey on LNER to Edinburgh. With more sparkling water and orange juice than you can shake a stick at, followed by the short hop to God's Own City, I checked in at my regular accommodation, the Pacific Key Premier Inn. Only I didn't, because it was double the price of where I actually stayed, the Ballata Street Premier Inn, designed with internal walls so thin you can hear your neighbour putting their socks on, and where my bathroom door must have been hung with an axe. Who said craftsmanship was dead? I've stayed in worse hotels, mind. One in Brighton was so unsavoury, a member of our party slept on top of the sheets. Luckily, I was saved that indignity, because a young lady kidnapped me back to her flat. Anyway, Ballata Street was fine, even if the bedroom window view didn't quite match Pacific Key. Remaining on a hotel theme, I went to observe the never-ending desecration of 286 Clyde Street. 286 was demolished in 2018, and construction of the 294-room Clayton Hotel is yet to be completed as of May 2022. I'm struggling to see how a successful marriage can be formed between this multi-storey design and the old custom house, which is planned as the Clayton Hotel entrance. But next year should reveal if the hotel's four-star rating extends to the architecture. A spot of gentle wandering filled the rest of the day, where I encountered this dirty stained glass window on Adams Court Lane, painted stone signs on Howard Street, noticed newly installed vehicle charging points under the Kingston Bridge, ruining the cinematic location I had planned to use for my still not written avant-garde film, and Socky Hall Lane, a grimy alley the like to which I'm always drawn. Fancying refreshment, I popped into Variety Bar for a glass of lemonade, only to find it doesn't accept cash. Cash is king in my art gallery Ponson world, so I left and entered the Lauders at 76 Socky Hall Street, which I'm sure used to be an honest down-to-earth spit and sawdust pub. It's not anymore, and wasn't to my taste. Even less to my taste was the £2.20 for a glass of lemonade, and I sat in a window seat sulking, too mean to leave my drink. When I asked the King of Glasgow if he wished to accompany me to Rothsey, he was less than enthusiastic, but in the end he agreed, mostly to stop me pestering him. We arranged to meet under the central station clock, and I said, I'll have a rose in my lapel. His response was scurrilous and unrepeatable. The ticket price from Central Station, including the ferry, was £15.75 return, which is tremendous value, and the ferry was my reason for visiting Rothsey. I love ferries, they have a serene, relaxing, stately progress. The ferry was clean, comfortable and punctual, with friendly, polite staff. After a reasonable priced hot chocolate for me, an espresso for His Majesty, we headed on deck for the voyage, which was so pleasurable it bordered on therapeutic. Normally I research a destination, except if I'm visiting with the King, because he knows everything. So when he said he has little knowledge of Rothsey, I assumed he was being humble. He wasn't. His single nugget of information was that Lena Zavaroni's family had several businesses on the island. Lena Zavaroni was a child star who I confused with Bonnie Langford. The King corrected me that Miss Zavaroni was not in the 1970s Just William TV series, but was in fact famous for her version of Ma, He's Making Eyes At Me. I watched a YouTube video of Lena performing this song linked below, and it was disturbing to hear an adult's voice emit from a small child's frame, along with the inappropriate lyrics for a child. It's not surprising Lena was a troubled soul. 
The 13th century castle with very cool moat was closed to visitors for masonry inspections, so after a cursory look and perusal of adjacent information sites, we sought sustenance, which was taken in the Kettle Drum Cafe at 32 East Princes Street. The cafe was bustling. Despite this, we were soon served our eggs, bacon and toasted sourdough bread. The food was good and I'd have no qualms returning. I wanted to climb Serpentine Road for the view. It's quite a steep hill and the King had a troublesome ankle which made him unsure it was a good idea. But I only made him carry me half the way up and he was fine. We strolled leisurely back to the harbour for the return trip and another dose of fantastic ferry therapy. It would be remiss of me not to mention Weems Bay Station. The mock Tudor exterior is horrendous, so we'll quickly move to the interior, which is a thing of beauty. Constructed in 1903 to the designs of James Miller, the station is a time capsule. One can imagine passengers emerging from their train to be met with light, light and more light, thinking, our holiday begins here. The station sweeping design, including the covered pier with wonderful wood decked floor leading to the ferry terminal, eschews corners and attempts to provide a frictionless passenger flow from station platform to ferry. The station demands far more time than is available in this video, so I've pasted links with further information below. Back in Glasgow we partook of more hot chocolate and coffee, augmented with a plate of calamari in Browns at number 1 George Square. Browns I found pretentious, populated by pretentious patrons, two of whom were the King and I. It's somewhere I'd have qualms about returning to. And the calamari was overdone. In the evening I walked past the Driftwood pub at 2 St George's Road busy with a young clientele, and blasting out of the door was the 1984 release song Footloose by Kenny Loggins from the also 1984 film of the same name. Maybe it was a knowing choice, but I was baffled as to why youngsters would tolerate such a track. Were the punk wars fought all for naught? Alloa is not short of churches, and it's fitting my first destination was Greenside Cemetery, adjacent to the ruined old parish church of St Mungo. The church was repaired and enlarged in 1680 by Tobias Bashup. By 1816 it was deemed unsafe, and the new St Mungo's on Bedford Place, which opened in 1819, was built as a replacement, utilising some of the stones from the old St Mungo's. The cemetery is accessed by weekday appointments due to unsafe perimeter walling. Unfortunately, I visited on a Saturday and stood with my face pressed to the railings like a child at a sweet shop window. A gent spoke to me while I was shooting through the cemetery gates. He lived in one of the Kirkgate flats and invited me in to see the flat's courtyard, which was once part of the old parish church. There was also a small walled garden, kept immaculate by one of the residents. They were two lovely spaces, but I didn't want to abuse his kindness by taking photos, which I felt may have been deemed intrusive. Alloa Tower was built in the 14th century to guard a Fourth River ferry crossing. It has undergone alterations over the centuries, and according to a 1928 written field report, the four storeys stand 20.7 metres high, with an oblong footprint measuring 19 metres by 12 metres. The report comments the battlement's parapet walk is notably spacious due to the tower's unusually thick walls and the corner rounds platforms are raised considerably above the parapet walk. The late 18th century Renaissance doorway probably occupies the original entrance doors position and is where visitors are admitted for a £6.50 fee with no concessions for art gallery ponces. I was outraged. Actually, £6.50 is quite reasonable, but I didn't have time to take a look. Luckily, Furniture Went Mad, who writes all the music for Erase Culture videos, visited in 2020 and sent me some photos. 
Close by is Kilncraigs, the former office block of John Pattinson and Company Limited, now the home of Clackman and Shire Council. Patterns were wool spinners, established in 1814. At their height, Patterns employed thousands of people, becoming the largest wool spinning company in Britain, and by 1900 new premises were required. William Kerr was tasked with designing the 1904 completed office block, with instructions it should reflect Patterns domestic and international status. Kerr's vision is certainly ambitious, verging on palatial. The four-storey, 13-bay structure is in the English Baroque style. Baroque architecture has always demonstrated power and has often been adopted by rulers. Indeed, it was favoured by the Catholic Church who wished to exhibit its power to Protestant groups. Fine detailing, including my favourite dentil moulding, abounds, and like Weems Bay Station, Kiln Craigs warrants more time than this video can afford. Alawa hosts several Andy Scott sculptures, two of which I encountered. Scott was responsible for the Kelpies, mention of which breaks furniture went mad out in a cold sweat. It's safe to say he's not enamoured with Mr Scott. It could be worse though, there could be works by the dreadful Tracy M in. There is another collection of sculptures dotted around town, in the form of mirrored figures by Rob Mulholland. I couldn't understand the works until I visited his website and realised they're dependent on the angle at which they're viewed to appreciate them. To quote Mulholland's website, He incorporates mirrored surfaces in his sculptures to reflect the given environment and alter the viewer's perception of the space. The reflection is purposely distorted, inviting the viewer to question their individual relationship with their surroundings. I envisaged a harbour similar to Hull Marina, with pleasure boats and pubs. The reality was a small picnic area, albeit with attractive river views. I nipped back to my hotel, washed my face and wandered to Overton Park in Rutherglen, which was further than I imagined, and mostly along a busy road filled with industrial buildings, not in the English Baroque style. I'd intended to shoot the 1914 Overton Park bandstand for the last couple of Glasgow visits, and having finally reached Rutherglen, I was lucky to find it home, because it has a tendency to move around. It started life at the Mill Street end of the park and moved to its current position where it seemed settled for a good period, before it upped sticks for the Stoke-on-Trent Garden Festival in 1986, returned home for a rest and then gallivanted to the south end of Bells Bridge for the Glasgow Garden Festival in 1988. After the festival it was once again located in Overton Park, where it appears to have been neglected since. Cast by Walter McFarlane and company in their Postle Park foundry, this is a quintessential octagonal cupola roofed bandstand, placed on a low platform. The design is near perfect. Sadly, many colour schemes have been employed. Currently it's black with gold and blue detailing. Gold and black is hideous. Bandstands should be white. Black is acceptable, but never with gold. Gold is gauche. If refurbished, which is desperately required, and gold avoided, Overton Park Bandstand will be a gem. Also in Overton Park, I encountered the Victorian Water Fountain. If I thought the Bandstand's colour scheme were right, the fountain's offensive black and gold paint is so thickly applied and garish, I uttered a stream of incredulity-induced profanities. And there are Masonic owls atop every supporting column. I shall be petitioning the King for the fountain's removal. Kilmarnock Railway Viaduct's 23 arches have a sense of immovable solidity and provided a welcome to Kilmarnock that made me smile. Viaducts are cool, especially Harringworth Viaduct in Rutland. Along with bridges, cemeteries draw me in and the 1875 red sandstone Kilmarnock Cemetery gates, complete with conical tower, instantly grabbed me and I spent a pleasing hour strolling in the sunshine. Heading back to town, I entered Kay Park, named after Alexander Kay who bequeathed the money for its purchase, 
and fell into conversation with a lady overlooking the pond. She had returned to the area after 40 years and lamented when she left Kilmarnock was booming with industry and jobs galore. It was now a shadow of itself, continuing the empty shops on the high street were a sorry sight. Lightening the mood, I asked if there was a bandstand in Cape Park, to which she replied, there used to be, but it's long gone. There may be one in Howard Park though. Leaving her to enjoy the pond, I noted her recommendation to visit John Finney Street. Continuing through the park, I asked a couple seated near the Burns Monument if there was a bandstand in Howard Park. They weren't sure, mostly because they weren't local. Reaching Howard Park, I inquired about the bandstand with a gent walking his dog, and he gave me directions. The bandstand is now a basketball hoop that's rooted in the bandstand's place. This is not a desirable exchange in my eyes. Here's a photo of the bandstand from Sandy Stevenson's Tour Scotland blog, linked in this video's description. Rugby Park is a proper football ground, surrounded by housing. From a time when people walked to their local club instead of driving miles to support a successful team they have no affiliation with in a vain attempt to bolster their self-esteem. On Rugby Crescent, a resident sitting outside his house enjoying the sunshine saw me shooting Rugby Park and began a conversation. Overlooking the ground, as his house did, I asked if football fans caused him and his neighbours any litter or vandalism problems. Not really, he replied, continuing that it was a great location to live. He said the only issues are when Rangers and Celtic descend like marauding tribes. And even then, it's mostly thoughtless parking blocking the residents' cars. The gent, like the lady in K Park, had also recently returned to Kilmarnock after his 1980s departure. He also mourned the loss of industry, state of the high street, and suggested I visited John Finney Street. So that's where I headed next. John Finney was born in Kilmarnock in 1790 and left in 1807, never to return. If he had, he would have probably bemoaned the high street's empty shops. He made his money working for Finney Brothers and Company in Brazil returning to Britain around 1851. A new street for Kilmarnock was muted and fundraising began in 1863 under Archibald Finney, chairman of the Kilmarnock Town Improvement Trust and John Finney's nephew. Public subscriptions didn't cover the street's construction so John Finney donated to the fund and the new street was named after him in recognition of his largesse. Hunger had the better of me, and I popped into the new hot wok noodle bar on King Street. I let the lady behind the counter guide my choice of chicken noodles with vegetables and a splash of sweet and sour sauce, but was nonplussed when she asked if I wanted gravy. A gent from Stirling received his order the same time as mine, and we crossed the road to eat on the recently created St Marnock Square, with its Anne Livingston Boyd mural, who seems to be portrayed as a southern belle. Five minutes later, the lady from the noodle bar brought us over a can of iron brew each free of charge. What a kind gesture. The noodles were good too. Alighting the train in Glasgow, I pondered if Central Station Concourse is the most impressive in Britain. And yes, I think it is. On the way to meet His Majesty at the Queen's Park Victoria Road entrance for an exploration of Govan Hill, I tweeted this urban scene of Eglinton Street. At TJ Scars replied that his father once owned the green shop at the end of the row. It was an electrical appliance repair shop called Rapid Repairs, which had previously been located across the road, next to a record and DJ shop titled The Entertainment Centre both of which TJ had worked in as a youngster. Here's a photo of him putting up a poster in the entertainment centre. He said rapid repairs closed around 2000, when appliance replacement became cheaper than appliance repair. Govan Hill, an evocative kind of place, a proud place once famous for resisting change and now for embracing it an urban district which boasts buildings designed by great architects like Greek Thompson.
yet afflicted by slums, exploitative landlords, poverty and worklessness. Govan Hill, always home to migrant communities, to the Irish, the Pakistanis, low-rent hipsters and now a range of continental Europeans. Govan Hill fought off the wrecking ball during the 1960s and 70s and thank God for it includes the classic architecture of Queen's Drive, all curves and carvings, the beautiful sandstone of the late 19th century. It includes the stunning Queen's Park and majestic Victoria Road. Rough and ready for sure. Needing further improvement? Absolutely. But Govan Hill is Glasgow and Glasgow is Govan Hill. Early evening I walked back to Queen's Park to take some shots over the city. Shots taken, I entered the Queen's Park Arena, where a traditional bandstand once stood until it was relocated to Duchess Park in Motherwell, and an open-fronted building replaced it. The arena was showing the Big Lebowski free of charge. It being Glasgow, the heavens opened, and all but the hardy viewers headed for shelter. I sheltered lurking under some trees near the Victoria Road entrance. For what seemed so long, I was in danger of being picked up by Thatcher's bully boys. Eventually the rain lessened and I made my way back to town, treating myself to a pastry from the Finiston Street Lidl. Hotel checkout was noon and instead of lazing around I thought a leg stretch before the train journeys home a good idea. Hampden Park was the destination, because you never know when footage of a stadium will be required. After shooting I fancied a breakfast roll, and on reaching Butter Biggins Road, my nose twitched and I spied the to and fro of workmen at brunches. I entered and ordered a sausage, egg and bacon roll with tomato sauce, but I'm quite happy with HP sauce if you're judging me. I crossed the road and ate in Millennium Park, which I thought was a bit of wasteland with benches until I looked it up. The roll was filling, tasty and the service swift and polite. I'll definitely return next year if I stay on Ballater Street. Did I neglect Glasgow this year? Probably, but sometimes you have to keep your love on their toes, even if you are hopelessly in love with them as I am with Glasgow. And there's always next year. Huge thanks to the King for his outrageous kindness and brilliance. Without him, these videos could not be made. Thanks mate, you're a star. <laughs>